yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer and he is in you and you need not be afraid. And now, Hal Lindsey's Bible study of the book of John. But then he says this, he says, but I testify to you this. Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power of God. Boom. Then they all demanded, so you are the Son of God. And he answered, it is just as you have said, I am. And they said, what need have we for more testimony? See, they had to, they had to get the same thing out of him before the officially convened Sanhedrin. You get an official indictment. And they said, what need have we for more testimony? We have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And the entire assembly, the Sanhedrin, the high priests, the scribes and elders condemned him to death. So they bound Jesus and took him away to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. All right, that brings us to trial number four. Now, I'm going to read John's account of this one, primarily anyway. All right, starting in John chapter 18, verse 28. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now, it was early morning. They bring him before Pilate. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. They're kind of insolent with the governor. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. Well, we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. Well, they killed a lot of people. They're just kind of passing the buck to the Roman governor. Verse 32, this happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. You see, if they, if they had gone ahead and executed him, they would have stoned him to death. But the, Jesus predicted that he was going to be crucified. See, the slang word for crucifixion, crucifixion was, they're going to lift me up. And when I am lifted up, see, they knew what that slang word was. They knew that meant crucified. So this happened, it says, to fulfill what Jesus had predicted. But it also happened to fulfill something else. Hold your place here and turn with me to Psalm chapter 22 in verse 11. I hope this is as interesting to you. <clears throat> Be not far from me. For trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. That's a broken piece of pottery. And my tongue cleaves to my jaws, the intense thirst. And thou dost lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. And uh, caliph, or dog in Hebrew, that was a, a term that the uh, Jews of Jesus' day used for Gentiles. They call Gentiles dogs. So they're saying, dogs, Gentiles have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. Who do you think they are? They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Anything sound familiar there? 
You know, this is this is one of the most powerful psalms of the prophet. There are a lot of prophecies in the psalms. And uh, this is a psalm that is dedicated to the suffering of the Messiah. And it's like the Holy Spirit set this psalm up so that we wouldn't miss that this is about the Messiah. Because look how it starts. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know that that's in all three of the, uh, God, it's in Mark. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in each one of them, remember, what is the, what do the inspired authors do? They quote the original Hebrew and then translate it. But in all three of them, they quote the original Hebrew. Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, why did the Holy Spirit cause him to do that? It's like the Holy Spirit never wanted those original words to be lost in the many translations he knew the scriptures would go through so that those who seriously are looking for the Messiah would look back and see, oh, wait a minute, this is the beginning of Psalm 22.1. And I believe the Holy Spirit did that so we would be driven to come back and look at this psalm and see that it relates perfectly to the sufferings of Jesus when he died for our sins. Eli, Eli, lama sabbatani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then it says, Far from deliverance are the words of my groaning. O oh my God, I cry by day, but thou dost not hear. And by night, but I have no rest. You see, he raises this question. I heard of, you know, they, they seem to get the most blasphemous men to teach the Bible as literature in our universities here in America. But I heard one of them take this psalm and say, you see, Jesus finally admitted that he wasn't the Son of God and he didn't know what was going to happen. Because he, you know, reading from the gospel, he said, look, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, God forsook him because he was deluded. If ever I almost got up and punched a guy out in this class, that was it. But the Lord reminded me that he'll take care of it. Now note, it says, I cry in the day. And thou, thou dost not answer. And literally, in the night season, I have no rest. Isn't it interesting that on the cross, first three hours is day. The last three hours, it was dark. He talks about crying to God during the daylight and in the night. Because it was dark all over the earth. And I've always noted this. My God, my God. He doesn't say my God once. He doesn't say my God three times. He says my God twice for a good reason. Because God the Son was hanging on the cross and he cried out to my God the Father and my God the Holy Spirit. The scripture is very accurate. But then as you go through here and you come to these words in chapter 22, verse 44, he's, uh, 14, I'm sorry. He says, I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. You know, when you hang on the cross, one of the most excruciating things is first you're in the oriental sun, naked. And what? Moisture you have left in your body just pours out of you. 
and hanging by your own weight throws all of your bones out of joint. And he says, my heart is like wax is melted within me. You see, your heart begins to fall from the sheer exhaustion and weight and stress that's going on. And he says, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. He's, he feels like a broken piece of pottery. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. This is the horrible, agonizing thirst that comes in that heat and where there is such agonizing pain physically that you can't, you know, you, you desperately need just a drink of water. And he says, and thou dost lay me in the dust of death. Jesus willingly let this happen to him. He says, dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers had encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. This psalm was written around 1000 B.C. Crucifixion was not known as an execution method until about, uh, it was sometime around the time of Alexander the Great, sometime in the 300s BC. So 700 years before crucifixion was known, God had this prophet predict this is what would happen to the Messiah. There's no known torture that would apply to this except crucifixion. They pierce my hands and my feet with the nails. I can count all my bones. Let's just see the, his body stressed and stretched out and his bones begin to show through the flesh. His back has already been laid into ribbons with a cat of nine tails. By the way, when Jesus hung on the cross, you heard the part in the even in the trial where I was bringing out that they repeatedly slapped him, they repeatedly punched him. That was only a, a tender prelude to what the Roman soldiers did to him. And you know, Isaiah chapter 52 says, my, my face is so marred, I no longer look human. That's what it literally says in Hebrew. My face is so marred, I no longer look human. He had to die by the hands of a Roman because that was their way of executing. It had all been predicted. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken, verse 32 of John 18, uh, that Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is this your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You see, Pilate knew that. Hey, if you were trying to start an insurrection, your your uh, followers would have fought to keep you from being arrested. But they didn't. And then he begins to really spook Pilate when he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And in verse 37, he says, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you have said correctly that I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. Pilate, what is truth? Doesn't that show the emptiness of the Roman society and, uh, well, of the whole world, really? What is truth? You can see that he's already 
sold his soul to ambition and everything else. And in the Roman culture, truth wasn't really a big issue. What is truth? And uh, Pilate asked, with this he went out and again to the Jews said, I find no basis for a charge against him. In Luke 23, verses 5 through 11, this is what is said after that. But they insisted he stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, he said he started in Galilee. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. <laughs> Here's another guy passing the buck. When Jesus is sent back to him from Herod, Pilate is actually frightened because his wife sent word to him, be careful what you do with this man, for he is a holy man. Do him no harm, or you'll be harmed. And so Pilate was, was spooked. And seeing the absolute composure in the face of all he's going through, he knew this was not any ordinary man. He was not a mere man. So Pilate's already getting kind of spooked here. And he's trying to, he's trying to persuade the Jews to let him off. And so when this gets a little too hot to handle, he decides, you know, he didn't like Herod very much anyway, so he decides, I'll, I'll get this over to Herod and let him try to handle it. So now we come to trial number five. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some miracle. See, Herod wanted to be entertained. Man, this guy is better than any magician. He can do miracles, you know. This is great. It's awfully nice of Pilate to send him over. We need a little break in things and boredom. So it says in verse 9, he plied Jesus with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Jesus wouldn't go along with anything. He just didn't pay him any mind. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. Well, Herod got bored with that. He didn't want his, his, uh, the, he was on vacation from Galilee into Jerusalem. He didn't want to go through all that rigmarole with all these uh, nitpicking Pharisees. So Herod just uh, took, he, he had had enough and he figured he wasn't going to get uh, entertained. So it says that, uh, Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. And there's a parenthesis here. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they, they had been bitter enemies. So Herod sends Jesus back to Pilate for the final trial, trial number six before Pilate. Now beginning with Luke 23, verse 13. Pilate called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man uh, as one who was inciting people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us and as you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. See, he was spooked. He really wanted to let Jesus go. But with one voice, they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Now Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. So they wanted a murderer released to him rather than Jesus. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? 
What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, shouts they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. So in the process, at the end, Pilate had a basin of water brought out, and officially, this, this was not just a gesture, this was an official judicial act in the Roman courts. He washed his hands in the presence of them to let them know he had absolutely nothing to do with this because there was no grounds for guilt. Now, this was really, uh, I mean, just look what Jesus endured. When you stop and think about who he really is, to have endured this, to have been beaten, when, when the soldiers took charge of him after this, they put the crown of thorns on his head as they got him ready for, for execution. And the Roman soldiers, it says in the Greek, repeatedly punched him. He had strength, physical strength, beyond anything we ever have known in a human being. And so as the soldiers kept punching him, he didn't go down. He didn't lose consciousness. And this infuriated them and caused them to hit him harder. You imagine what happened? Here is a man who wouldn't go out. They couldn't knock him out. In verse 13, Isaiah 52, verses 13 through 15. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people. So his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Thus, he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouth on account of him. For what they had not been told, they will see. And what they had not heard, they will understand. Can you understand that prophecy? It's saying that when, when the Messiah comes, he will later be highly exalted. But before, he will be so completely beaten that his face will not look human, his body broken. And yet in doing that, he will sprinkle, like the offering in the temple, sprinkle the blood on the altar. He will sprinkle many nations to pay for their sins. For what they had not been told, they will see. You see, here the Jews, they are trying to keep from being uh, ceremonially unclean by going into a Roman court. So he had to come out on the pavement to a place that he had there to judge Jesus outside of the Roman fort. And they were all fastidious about not breaking any of those customs and all of that. And yet, here they were condemning the Passover lamb. They were blind. And yet it says, by what Jesus did, the nations, the Gentiles, will understand. Kings will shut their mouth at him. What they had not been told, they will understand. So it's predicting that when the Messiah came and offered himself, his own people would reject him. And he would give his salvation to the nations. And that's how chapter 53, verse 1 begins. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? You see, he's saying, my people, who will believe? Isaiah's a Hebrew prophet. He says, among my people, who will believe the message? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of the parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, 
nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. We did not esteem him. Isaiah, a Hebrew prophet, is talking about his people. We, the Israelites, did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, and yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we're healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. And he willingly took it. He laid aside his divine power and allowed himself to be abused in any way the hatred of man saw fit. What a savior. Thank God he died for you and died for me and we can just receive that forgiveness and be born spiritually into God's forever family. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you, when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon, that you are already in heaven as far as he's concerned. As I prepared for this week's program, I was again struck by the speed with which events are moving into the scenario the prophets predicted for the end times. I believe we're there. People on the street are talking about what all of these things mean. Folks that wouldn't darken the door of a church or pick up a, a Bible are now very curious. This may be our greatest opportunity maybe even our last opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ before we're silenced by political correctness. The message that God has given me is more important now than it's ever been for the church and for the nation. That's why I'm asking you to help me to expand our reach. You can find more of Hal Lindsey at his website, www.howlindsey.com. There you can access our video and article archives. Visit our online store for Hal Lindsey CDs, books, and other specialty items. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Hal Lindsey Media Ministries, P.O. Box 470470, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74147. You can also support this ministry online. Visit howlindsey.com or call 1-888-RAPTURE.